In this video, we're going to continue discussing chemical potential within solutions and look at it for the solution and the vapor which exists above this solution. So we have our solution here. Again, it has two components, A and B. Both of those were liquids at room temperature. We mix them together thoroughly and they form a liquid solution of A and B here. It's a solution and that was in the liquid phase. And then each of these is going to evaporate off particles from the surface until the vapor pressure at that temperature and pressure is reached. And you're going to have some equilibrium amount of vapor or gas of each A and B molecules which are evaporating off from the surface of the solution there. So that has some vapor pressure uh, PA and PB, which is going to be there, in addition to whatever is going on in the solution here. Okay, so we want to look at the chemical potential of this vapor phase and the solution phase. So in order to do that, we're going to look at what the Gibbs energy is. And the Gibbs energy is just going to be the sum of the Gibbs energy of the solution, Gibbs G sol of the solution, plus G vap. Gibbs energy of the vapor phase, of the gas phase. And then the differential of this, dg, is just going to be dg sol plus dg vap. So the change in our total Gibbs energy is going to be the change in the solution plus the change in the vapor of their each of their Gibbs energies. Now we're going to make the assumption that there are no particles which are appearing or disappearing. If there's a particle of A, it either exists as solution or as vapor. If there's a particle of B, it exists as solution or vapor, and it cannot leave the system. So we're going to assume that they have reached some type of equilibrium whereby the number of particles is going to be constant. So the change in the number of particles of B in the vapor is going to be equal to the change of the number of particles of B in the solution. That's going to be equal to zero. And now we're just going to be concerned about the transfer of particles from of A to and from the solution as well. So we're fixing B. We're just using B as a fixed component and fixing its composition. And we're going to see what happens to A just to simplify things out. Okay, so then if we break G down in terms of these uh, partial derivatives here, we're going to have that DG is going to be equal to partial derivative of G with respect to number of moles of A. And that's going to be at constant temperature, pressure, and N of B, number of moles of B times change in the number of moles of A, and that's in the solution. So this was G of solution. So this is DG here, when we're changing the number of, of A particles here. Plus partial derivative of the Gibbs energy, if I can write a G, maybe. Gibbs energy of the vapor with respect to number of moles of A. Again, constant temperature, pressure, number of moles of B as we have fixed here and that's change in the number of moles of A in the vapor. So if, in case I didn't explicitly state that out up here as well let's just go ahead and write that that change in the number of moles of A in the vapor is just minus change in the number of moles of A in the solution. So they can either go from the vapor to the solution or from the solution to the vapor. Okay, so each of these here is the chemical potential of A in that given phase. So what I'm going to have there is we are going to have that DG under these circumstances is going to be chemical potential of A in the solution times change in number of particles of A in the solution plus chemical potential of A in the vapor times change in the number of moles 
of A in the vapor. Okay, and we know this relation here that they have to be equal and opposite for this DNA sol and DNA vap. So we can transfer that term down here as DG. It's going to be mu A of solution minus mu A of vapor times change in the number of moles of A in the solution. Just substituting in here that DNA VAP is minus DNA Sol. Okay, so at equilibrium, there are going to be no differences in the chemical potential between these two phases for A. So at equilibrium, that is where the Gibbs energy is not changing anymore. So DG equals zero at equilibrium. So we're going to be setting DG equal to zero there. But there will still be particles transferring back and forth at some finite rate. So this term isn't going to be zero here, this uh, change in the number of particles. It's going to go back and forth. But in order to make this zero, what we have happen is that the chemical potential of A in the solution equals its chemical potential in the vapor. So moving a particle from creating a particle in either the solution or the vapor, a particle of A will create the same amount of Gibbs energy because these two phases are in equilibrium. So that means that at equilibrium we have chemical potential of A in the solution is going to equal chemical potential of A in the vapor. And that's true of any phases which are in equilibrium with each other. Any phases which are in equilibrium with each other, the chemical potential needs to be equal to one another. And so we already had an expression for what the Gibbs energy was of a gas as a function of the pressure or as a function of the fugacity if it's a non-ideal gas. But if it's an ideal gas, you can go back to our discussions of the Gibbs energy because remember chemical potential is just the molar Gibbs energy our mu A is just equal to the molar Gibbs energy of A so what we have is that if our vapor is ideal if the vapor behaves as an ideal gas then the chemical potential of A in solution, which is in equilibrium with the chemical potential of A as a vapor, is going to equal the standard chemical potential of A at the given temperature plus the gas constant R times Kelvin temperature times the natural log of the vapor pressure from A. Now this is just a formula straight from the Gibbs energy uh, chapter that your, your molar Gibbs energy here, or chemical potential, your molar Gibbs energy is equal to the standard state molar Gibbs energy plus, and then it's a function of pressure as a function of RT times the natural log of pressure. So pre the Gibbs energy changes as the natural log of pressure deviates from standard pressure, which is one bar. We can write that down as well, that standard pressure is one bar of pressure. And that's the same for vapor, vapor pressure as well. Okay, now we're going to define another quantity, and that is going to be the chemical potential of pure liquid A. So we're going to have mu A star. Notice this asterisk up here in the superscript. And that's going to be the chemical potential mu of pure liquid A. So that's A without any B in it, and it's in the liquid phase, the pure chemical, chemical potential of pure liquid A. So this is going to be a quantity which is going to be very helpful for us as well. So if we had just pure liquid A there, then it would just be liquid A and it would have some vapor pressure above it and its pure vapor pressure of the liquid in equilibrium with its vapor would be equal to its chemical potential. So we would have 
mu a star for the liquid equals mu a star for the gas, for the vapor. And that would be equal to, again, the standard, need to make that, the standard chemical potential, standard molar Gibbs energy, plus RT log pressure, vapor pressure of pure liquid A. Okay, so here's our chemical potential of if it was pure liquid A. Here's our chemical potential of A as a part of a binary solution. And we can combine these two together because we have the standard state in both cases here. So if you set this mu A equal to that mu A and you solve for what you got here, you'd have you know mu A of solution minus RT log PA, vapor pressure of A in a solution. And then here you'd have mu A star minus RT log vapor pressure of pure A. So combining those two equations, what we're going to get as a final result is that the chemical potential of A in a solution is going to be equal to the chemical potential of pure A as a liquid plus RT log the ratio of the vapor pressure of A as a part of a solution divided by the vapor pressure of the pure solution of A. So this is going to be a very useful equation for us going forward telling us how the solution is behaving because the vapor pressure of A in a solution is giving us insight into what its chemical potential is and how it is behaving relative to if it were a pure liquid itself. So what this means is that we have the chemical potential of A in a solution is going to approach the chemical potential of A as a pure liquid as the vapor pressure of A in a solution approaches the vapor pressure of A as a pure liquid. Because if PA equals PA star, then mu A equals mu A star. And if, our, if we have high enough concentrations that this gas is going to behave non-ideally, then we can just replace these with fugacities instead of pressures. But generally, vapor pressures are going to be quite low. They're going to be much lower than one bar. And even gases up to one bar generally behave quite close to ideally. So for the most part, this is going to be okay treating these as ideal vapors because these vapor pressures are quite low. But even if they were, we could replace them with fugacities. And then this uh, would hold as well for much higher uh, and non-ideal gases.